Hi, this is Mark Birch with quick analysis of John Donne's selected poems. Hi, right, thanks for coming back for the second round of this um, and for the second stanza. The second stanza begins with Donne seemingly praising the sun, thy beams so reverend and strong. But the grammatical structure, complemented by the use of enjambment, allows Donne to undermine that expectation. What we recognise is that the claim that the sun's rays are so reverend and strong is actually a claim presented by the sun itself not those that are judging the sun and the setting of the expectation develops the sense of the sun's misplaced arrogance it thinks its rays are so reverend and strong but dunn is going to show why that's misplaced the arrogance of the sun is uh, represented partly through the contrast with a wink which represents a tiny action that requires very little energy. So while the sun believes itself to be reverend and strong, Dunn subverts that uh, claim by representing his ability to eliminate the sun's rays through this very simple small act. Um, Dunn conveys the effect of the small action through the semantic field of the weather referring to those aspects of the heavens that can also eliminate the sun, uh, eclipse and cloud, uh, before eventually empowering himself by claiming that same ability, but again, that same ability through very little effort, undermining any kind of sense of grandeur in the sun. He then goes on to state, but, but that I would not lose her sight so long. He has the ability to cloud the sun with a wink, something that takes very little effort, but also the wink takes a very short period of time to be affected. And so he's therefore using hyperbole in order to flatter his beloved through the claim that the only reason that he won't destroy the sun is because that that tiny period of time when his eyes closed would be too long to deny himself the opportunity of seeing his beloved. The beauty and power of his beloved's eyes are implicitly compared to the sun. The sun may not be able to look around the world because its eyes may have been blinded by those of the woman. So conventionally, eyes are compared to the brightness of the sun. In a Petrarchan model, um, it would be classically used to suggest that they're bright and uh, beautiful. But here, Dunn suggests that his beloved's eyes are superior to the brightness of the sun. If her eyes have not blinded thine, they must be brighter than the sun, more powerful than the sun, in order to potentially blind the sun itself if it looks at her. So the poetic voice asks the sun if it can still see, having uh, potentially been observed by his beloved, um, to check where the Indias of Spice and Mine now lie. Um, this is interesting contextually because um, the Indias of Spice and Mine, the East and West Indies, were newly discovered areas that were essentially the sources of great wealth. Uh, the West Indies is where gold was mined and the East Indies provided rare and expensive spices. Dunn may also be using a homographic pun by referring to the Indias of Spice and Mine. Uh, mine might be a gold mine, but it could also be a reference to a possessive pronoun, the India of Mine, the India that I own, being a metaphorical reference to his lover, something incredibly precious and valuable. Dunn suggests basically that the sun's journey around the globe is pointless because everything of value in the world is in this room. The poem states, ask for those kings whom thou sawest yesterday, and thou shalt hear all here in one bed lay. And that homophonic pun on here and here is really conspicuous. It draws attention to the different possibilities because those words which have the same sound have different meanings. Um, therefore, things of value in the world can be said to exist in the wider world or in one bed. Essentially, Dunn's drawing our attention to the microcosm versus the macrocosm, the possibility that there are different ways of viewing the same thing. Similar to the anniversary, Dunn's presenting the idea that the lovers are kings. And again, he's exploiting the concept of the microcosm. They're the kings of the only world that matters, the world of their love. The final stanza extends the second's conceit of kings, all here in one bed lay. 
uh, they're the microcosm of the universe, although Dunn does offer a hierarchy within their world where the woman is all states and he is all princes. He is effectively the ruler of those states. And this hierarchy, we've got to remember, would be pretty conventional in the Elizabethan period with its acceptance of largely patriarchal values. Dunn acknowledges the external world once again by stating that princes do but players. So princes exist, he recognises that, but their power and their rule is pointless given that they rule over nothing of true value. They pretend to have the power or value that's represented by Dunn and his beloved, but they're merely acting. They have a kind of distanced sense of significance and importance because they but play us. And they can only play us because the true value of anything in existence is the value of their love. Um, interesting that we've got an astrophe here in the first and second lines, conveying a sense of reversal structurally um, that could mirror the way in which princes and wealth are an inversion of that true wealth of the lovers, the profound nature and value of the love itself. It appears paradoxical for Dunn to assert that nothing else is, and yet immediately follow this statement with a reference to the existence of princes. But that paradox could be resolved through reference to the sentiments of the second stanza, that nothing else is truly of value. If we look at the next line, princes do but players compared to this, and that this is likely to be the lover's world, their relationship. All honours mimic all wealth alchemy. Well, mimic functions as a synonym for play. So all things of value are mere imitations of the valuable love that they share. It's just an imitation. References to alchemy are common metaphysical tropes. And here Dunn may be suggesting that all wealth is something sought after but never discovered, like other alchemical pursuits, the great elixir, the philosopher's stone because true wealth and value can only be found in their relationship. Dunn concludes by once again addressing the son directly. The son may be half as happy as the lovers as he's single, and the contrast to that can be found in the plural pronoun we. The sense of being less is contained within the verb contracted or made smaller. And there may also be a sense of the son gaining some happiness from Dunn's argument that the world's contracted thus. If the world is as small as the room in which the lovers lie, the son's work in warming the world is reduced. Dunn's effective, effectively making things easier for the son. The word contracted also functions as a homographic pun. The word has the denotation of a legal contract or vow, which in this case has been made such that the world is the room, again giving the son some happiness given the reduction in its duties. The poet states, thine age asks ease, and since thy duties be to warm the world, that's done in warming us. So the son's duty to warm the world is done, pun possibly intended, in warming us as Dunn and his lover are the world in microcosm. The son should be particularly happy that its duties are reduced because its age asks ease. It's old and needs to rest in contrast to the young lovers. And Dunn concludes with a geocentric conceit of the room as the world, with the sun encircling it. Dunn deconstructs a geocentric model of the universe, replacing the bed with the centre of the earth and the walls of the room with the celestial sphere containing the sun. The world is the room and the sun can now rest because its focus is narrowed. It hasn't got as much work to do. Now, there may seem a tension here, given that Dunn dismisses the sun in the first stanza. But it's the urgency of the sun that's dismissed, an urgency that might have put pressure on the lovers. But with a singular, unchanging focus, the demands of the sun in terms of change are completely eliminated. So in terms of the structure, the stanzas, uh, we have three ten line stanzas, which are incredibly regular. And that uniformity could mirror the unchanging nature of their love. The meter is similarly regular. We've got a pattern of iambic structure, including tetrameter, dimeter, a couplet of iambic pentameter, a couplet of tetrameter, and then back to pentameter. Um, so it is regular across the three stanzas. 
The rhyme scheme A B B A C D C D E E again that regularity perhaps representing uh, the universal nature of their love and the form we know a dramatic monologue and obeyed the dramatic monologue form elevating the poet the poetic voice in terms of uh, the way in which it has the authority to command the sun this powerful force and um, also we've got uh, the obeyed which is an unconventional obeyed which again allows the poetic voice to assert their authority over the sun not lamenting the rising of the sun and its ability to separate them but commanding the sun to essentially worship them to rotate about their room because they are the universe okay so 